introduce Chef Dana Herbert. I'm going to just cheat with my notes a little bit. Um, he was introduced to cooking and pastry um, while studying for his culinary degree at Johnson and Wales University. Um, maybe some of you recognize him from uh, TLC's first season, the flagship season of Cake Boss. We don't have cake here today. Dana, <laughs> Chef Dana said that he gets asked, well, where's the cake? Um, but yeah, the winner of the first season of Cake Boss. Um, he is known as Delaware's King of Cakes. Um, yeah, so maybe we can all take a trip out to, out to Delaware. It'll be good, good stuff, right? Good stuff for the pedometer. Um, we can burn some calories and then eat cake at the end of that, right? Um, so has been on a Vince Beard celebrity chef tour. Um, and, and basically, you know, your motto being portion control, anything can work. And I'm gonna let Dana take it over for a little All time. right, well thank you guys so much. I am uh, happy to be here at Carney. I had to make sure I was pronouncing it right because there's a Kearney, New Jersey that's spelled almost identically. Um, but I'm happy to be here in Carney sharing um, a little bit of what I love with all of you and that's food. Um, I got into cooking, I blame it on my grandmother. Um, I used to hang at the edge of her counter all the time. Um, hoping she would throw me some scraps from the cookies she was making or the beater from the cake. Um, she lives in Maryland, so we grew up on a lot of uh, crab cakes, potato salad, green beans, that sort of thing. Um, so I attribute my love of food to her. Like a lot of people, um, I have diabetes that runs through my family. My brother's a uh, type 1 diabetic. Uh, my grandparents uh, were type 2 diabetics for as long as I can remember, before I even knew what um, diabetes was. So every day my uh, grandparents would say, oh, I have to go take my sugar pill. And at the time, to a five-year-old and a three-year-old, we would run around the house trying to figure out where they're hiding the candy every single day when they're saying they have to go take their sugar pills. So it wasn't until my brother was diagnosed, and I think I might have been 16, so that made him uh, maybe 12 or 13, um, that I started to really understand what diabetes was, um, how it affected um, his blood sugar and the different effects it had on him. And so as life went on, um, I did all this stuff on these different shows, and um, I got a unique opportunity to work with Nova Nordisk in a field that um, I had passion for because it affected my family so much. With my brother and my grandparents, my dad was always um, on the borderline, shall we say, when she talked about pre-diabetes. He flirts in that area um, quite a bit. So um, when I got the opportunity to do something like this, I I jumped on it. It was, it was a perfect fit for myself and to help my family and help the community. So that's how Mr. Flour Butter Sugar, cake boss guy, got into healthy cooking. <laughs> uh, today we're going to do two dishes. Um, one of them is going to be a broccoli mac and cheese. Um, the other one's going to be a double orange glazed uh, pork chop. I mean chicken. I'm sorry. Um, so we'll do those two, and I'll show you how quick and easy they are. Because I'm all about good food, it being healthy. Um, keeping people eating healthy, but not taking up a ton of time so that you can spend time with the family and get back to doing what you love to do. So the first thing that we're going to do here is I'm going to put my pot on the stove, and as you saw, it was hot. I'm going to saute my onions for my broccoli mac and cheese. Now the things that we did ahead of time for you guys just for uh, demonstration purposes was that we went ahead and we blanched off our broccoli which I have in this cup here, and we went ahead and just cooked off our, our uh, pasta. But with the onions, you want to make sure that the pan's nice and hot. You hear that sizzle. Anybody ever went to someone's house and the food was like a little greasy? <laughs> Some people don't want to raise their hands because their friends are here right now. But the reason this normally could be greasy is because they started with a cold pan cold oil. So when the food uh, pours opened up from the heat, the oil just rushed inside. So you want to make sure it's nice and hot so we're all tang in it. But you'll find that you actually have to use less oil when it's nice and hot to keep the pan lubricated. Speaking, uh, Chef Dana, of oil, what healthy oil did we get this question a lot? Like, what are some healthy oils that you can cook with? And being Mr. Flour Butter, Flour butter sugar. Flour butter sugar for the butter lovers out there. What do you do? Sure. Um, so 
sure. So what I like to use, I'm an olive oil fan. Um, I like to use the uh, extra virgin olive oil. Um, that's where most of your nutrients are in the first one. There's some other products out there. They're like second press, third press. Um, but the first press, the, the greener one is where you get all your nutrients from. The other ones is more of a, just trying to make a little bit more money from what they're doing. But I like extra virgin olive oil. I like um, canola oil. If I'm making a salad dressing, and let's say it's um, delicate in flavor, um, say like chive, um, where you want the chives to come through, I'll use a grapeseed oil. Because the grapeseed's very neutral in flavor and allows whatever you're putting into it to come to the surface. And then I think the other question was um, for the butter lovers. About the butter. Yeah. About the butter. So for the butter lovers, um, what we typically do is we will saute in um, oil and add just like a teaspoon of butter to the end. Because I know some people love that butter flavor, but we know that cooking in pure butter is not the best thing for us. So we'll cook in more of a heart healthy oil and add just a tiny bit at the very end, just to get a little bit of, of that flavor that you're craving without blowing the numbers, so to speak. And that can, be, that can be a simple change that can make a big difference. Oh yeah, that's, that's a really yeah. easy one. All right. So I'm sauteing my onions, and you guys saw me add just a little bit of salt. Adding salt during the cooking process um, is a good thing in that, A, you know how much you're putting in there, B, you won't have to use so much at the end. Um, my dad was always one of those ones where, regardless of what mom made, as soon as he sat down, I think he got it from my grandfather, immediately. So I always say taste your food first before deciding to just add salt to it when you're going out or even when you're at home because you, you might find that you might not really need it. Yeah, and I've heard that that's an acquired taste, but if you can lessen it, then you'll find that you don't need it as much. Correct. Sea salt or salt? The question is, is sea salt or regular salt? I would prefer the, the sea salt. Um, I feel like I have to use less. The flakes are a little bigger. Um, to me, the, what is it, the iodized one and the round containers, it tastes a little bit more chemical than, um, than the sea salt does. Is coconut oil okay? Coconut oil? Um, coconut oil is decent. I think the, the doctors are still doing a few tests on coconut oil um, because of the way it reacts with different temperatures and so forth. And if anybody has questions as we're going through, yeah. please feel free to call them out. This is the this is Yep, you're in your own kitchen right now, so you feel free to ask any questions so you want. Does that mean we have to do the dishes? <laughs> <laughs> we'll just make a line over there, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Who was my person I picked on? You have dish duty now, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Now I have another appointment. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's your go-to. All right, so the next thing is we're going to add a little bit of uh, whole wheat flour to the onions. We're going to cook it just a little bit, just like you would um, a roux just to get that flour flavor out and get the thickening process going on. Just and like that. And that can be, again, another substitution with the whole wheat flour in an effort to get those 25 to 30 grams of fiber. Yeah. Little things that you can add in um, all make a big difference when you add it up at the end of the day. Okay. So the next step is we're going to add our milk. And I'm going to use a fat-free milk for this. Let that start to thicken just a little bit with that whole wheat flour. Now, I know during her presentation, she brought up um, reading labels. One thing you might want to take into account with fat-free products is making sure to check the carbs and to check the sodium. Sometimes with fat-free products, they might put a little bit of extra sugar in there or sodium to increase the flavor. So, if that's something that you're really watching for, just make sure to read the labels because it's, it's the blueprint of what you're putting in your body. Okay. So and speaking of, oh, no, you're, you're I right. was going to say though, on that line, when you're looking at the label with, with fat free, um, sugar free, has anybody, when they were diagnosed or knew somebody diagnosed, go out and 
buy them a bunch of sugar-free candy? No? Yeah, yes. Has anybody had an experience maybe with eating too much sugar-free candy? <laughs> and I was thinking probably when your brother was diagnosed, when I was diagnosed, you know, I was like, oh, sugar-free candy. Well, I, I can eat it, right? And I was 15, and um, they're a product that definitely can be used in your meal planning. Um, some people don't tolerate them as well. You'll see on the back of your sugar-free products, it's a little warning label that excessive consumption may have an effect that might lead you to the bathroom. I'll just keep it at that because we are at, in our kitchen at the table. I'll keep it, keep it non-nurse gross for you. Um, yeah. So, what, what do you, what's your experience with that? Well, it's funny you say that. I used to work at a convention center, and um, isomalt used to be something that was used for, um, for uh, cooking for diabetics and so forth. But like she said, it can make your tummy hurt. So my experience is that we were doing um, these beautiful sugar pieces for about three thousand. Uh, desserts and you know there was extra so I was eating them you know all day and then I got home and you know my wife was like you keep playing the flute like what is going on I'm <laughs> going around the house brunt, 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 brunt. and I was like something is wrong with me and I, I looked it up isomalt and they're like that's when I found out that um, on your tummy it can be a little tough yeah, for sugar, some people. Yeah. Sugar alcohols and when you look at the labeling with sugar free foods um, I, I think it's a little deceiving because, again, when I was first diagnosed, it's like, oh, I can have that. There's no sugar. We really need to focus on those carbohydrates because that's what breaks down and impacts. With sugar alcohols, they manipulate the, the sugar molecules. So the body, the gut has a harder time breaking it down. So some of those musical effects, for lack of a better word, can be because the body's taken the time to break it down. Um, Sugar-free pops. Some of, yeah, yeah. So for people that have experienced it, I feel yeah. Shut up, it feels yeah. Um, sometimes when you're really comparing labels, you'll find that in the sugar-free food items, if you look at the real stuff, the good stuff, right? Not to get away from the good and bad, but they can be worked into your meal planning without a problem, without the the flute, the flute effect. Yeah. <laughs> the flute effect. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing with sugar-free, I always say with like sugar-free desserts, mm -hmm. some people feel that, oh, it's a sugar-free cake or something like that, I can eat a whole lot of it. <coughs> yes, I can reduce some of the sugar um, in there in using, say, a stevia, a trubia, a slender, or so forth, but you have to take into account the flour still there. So it's still a carb, it's just slightly less. So you can't just go eat a whole lot of it. So something just to think about, food for thought. All right, so the next step here to our dish, I'm gonna add a little bit of dry mustard from broccoli mac and cheese. I have a little bit of salt here. I'm not gonna use it all though. I'm just gonna add a pinch. And then I'm gonna add the cheese so that can melt. Quiz, cheese, carbohydrate or non-carbohydrate? You didn't know you were getting a quiz. Huh. What do we think? Where does it fall? Sheet in your planning healthy meals. It actually falls under a non-carbohydrate. That doesn't mean eat blocks of cheese. <laughs> then you will. <laughs> we're, we're getting to potty talk here. I'm sorry. That's not my objective. But you know there are calories and fats in cheese as well. But from a blood sugar perspective, that's not going to zing you. What kind of cheese is it? This was a, a fat-free um, cheddar cheese. I advise using the sharp one. And using the sharp one, you can use less cheese because the flavor is still strong in there. Would you like using fat-free cheeses? Um, well, if there's an opportunity for me to reduce a little bit of the fat in my diet, I try to. Um, especially with me being in the industry that I am, I'm in dealing with food and also dealing with bakery products. If I can reduce a little than I do. Um, one of my tips at mealtime is I typically go very low carb only because my job is to taste carb for the most part during the day when I'm dealing with cakes and so forth. So most of my meals, I'll either have a very small amount of carb or almost no carb because I know throughout the day I'm tasting this and I'm tasting that and so forth. So that's just one of my little 
tidbits for myself. And as they say, diabetes is different for everyone. So um, though I don't have it, I kind of practice like I do, and I try to kind of watch what I'm eating and so forth. Because even my doctors at times was like, you know, you gotta watch your A1C, it's creeping up there a little bit. I'm like, oh, okay. And I think about, you know, my family history, and I'm like, I got you. So I just take steps to make sure I keep it under control. Yeah, and it's one of those things, too, it's ongoing. I mean, that's, that's the, the kind of the yuck side of diabetes is it's something that you constantly have to work at, you know. And a lot of times when people are newly diagnosed, you know, it's, you know, new diagnosis, I'm going to change the way I'm eating, I'm going to exercise more, and then maybe your A1C number improves. Um, and then it's kind of easy to get back to old ways. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to lie. Part of what keeps me accountable to my own health is this job that I do. Because I could not stand in front of a room full of people and, and not be doing what I'm encouraging other people to do. So that being said, I thank you for, for my motivation, for my own health. But I'm not perfect. And there is no perfect in diabetes. If there is, I want to meet that person, right? Because um, they have a book to write, and I will buy it. Um, but yeah, it's balance. It's it's, and you know, it's it's one of those things that food is such a big part of our daily lives. We can't go without it. So just again, the little things that will make a big difference. How many cards are going to be in this one? So in this one. Uh, for a one cup serving, I believe it is 45, yes, 45 grams of carbs. 45 grams of carbohydrate for one cup. And the recipe cards are actually in your folders as well. Um, pasta, again, usually about a cup. The this size is going to get you about 45. Pasta, pasta is tough. Mm -hmm. You know, even if, just you had mentioned with the, the sugar-free desserts. Now that we're in November, pie. Right, Thanksgiving. You know, you spoke to it in what? Cranberries, car, it's like a carb fest, right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, what, what do you do with, over the holidays? Well, over the holidays, um, I have a, a strategy um, that I like to use, um, especially with like Thanksgiving, because I mean, I come from a, a family where grandma, she, she never stopped cooking. You'd have to like tap out and just say, okay, grandma, I can't do any more waffles. I can't do any more omelets this morning, no more scrapple. Um, so for us at Thanksgiving, what we do is we might have Thanksgiving just a little bit earlier in the day. And what that does is it allows us to take all of that Thanksgiving food and break it into two different meals. So if you got the ham, you got the turkey, and there's beef there, um, you got all these different veggies, and of course you have all these different carbs, that's the easiest way to kind of break it up. So maybe at lunchtime we might have the mac and cheese, at um, dinner we might have the uh, stuffing. And we'll do it in smaller quantities, so a little bit of mac and cheese, a little bit of candy yams, next one's a little bit of stuffing, and it might be just a little bit of rice, but we don't feel like we get slighted because we've gotten to eat everything, but we just break it into multiple meals. And then during the snack times, that might be where we have like the additional protein or additional veggies. So we get it all, but we kind of plan to get it all instead of just having one big um, buffet at one at one sitting. Yeah, and a plan in place really can can make it easier to stick to if you know what your strategy is. Definitely right. going into it. But it's hard to get past the idea that what do we do on Thanksgiving? We eat and we go to the couch, right? Right. Sleep and watch right football. before the game. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We watched what our Huskers um, on Friday. What do we? We beat Iowa, correct? Nice. <laughs> okay. So this is the broccoli mac and cheese. I just topped it with a little bit of uh, breadcrumbs, but quick, simple, and easy, right? You can have a conversation while making. Yeah, absolutely. And some of the meals, um, depending on what you do, it's a good way to get the family involved. Teaching them skills right from the beginning. Because you find if you teach them from the beginning, it's kind of long-lasting. But it's harder to go back and be like, okay, girls, 
stop drinking all the Kool-Aid and stop drinking all this, because then they look at you like, wait a minute, you're the one that gave it to me. So if you start them off in the beginning, it's a, it's a lot easier for them to kind of develop that healthy lifestyle. And you'll find that even with sugars, they'll, they'll back away from things that are too sweet and so forth. Okay, so our next dish here, we're going to do the uh, double glazed chicken. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to cook off our chicken. We make sure our pan is nice and hot. And the recipe card, uh, card says pork, but we substituted chicken. Yes, substitute the chicken today. This is hungry. It's funny how you smell food and then the body just reacts, right? <laughs> And that, that too, you, know, you, you look to um, what your surroundings are at home. Um, you know, it's interesting, when I was working in a clinic and, and not kind of out in different areas, there, we always knew there was candy. Somebody always had the candy dish. You know, everybody always brought kind of their leftover cakes and desserts. Um, and I would find that if it was there, I could probably sneak past it once or twice without taking it. But then it's just like, oh, it's there. I don't know if anybody else finds that this happens to them as well. Just the process of it being there, I found that I would take it when I didn't necessarily need it. So sometimes eliminating those triggers, which I know it's tough if you've got kids or you know grandkids that come and expect you know the candy bowl to be there. But even substituting, you know, carrot sticks on the table. Yeah. Granted, it's not chocolate, but yeah, it's funny the body reacts to sight and smell almost like immediately. Like you see it and your body's like, here we go. And then smell it, well then now you're gonna double it. Yeah. yeah, and as we're tempting you with the sights and the smells, right? Easier said than done. All right, so we just wanna make sure our chicken is cooked off here. The pan's nice and hot, which it is. And so we're starting to sear that. The next step is we're going to uh, zest a few oranges. <coughs> right here. Who likes to cook at home? You do? You want to come up and play? You want to zest some oranges? In the room, um, the primary meal maker in the oh, house, just by a show of hands. You know what? I can't put my hand up. Right. I know, I know. And then I'll go back to, I'm a nurse, not a dietitian, so. Yeah, I'm fortunate. So, but I, I can feel the struggles of, you know, busy life and what do we make and how do we accommodate for somebody living with diabetes. Um, again, it's really knowing what you've got and So while she's zesting, I'm just flipping my chicken over, making sure we get it done on all sides. Chicken is one of those things, contrary to, say, beef or pork, you want to make sure that it is definitely cooked all the way through. Dana, would you say substituting um, higher fat proteins into recipes is an easy an easy fix or an easy way to reduce calories? Or what are your thoughts on help making a, a recipe a little more healthy? Well, um, I always start with the either the proteins or the amount of oil that's going in there. I try to find a way to get the healthy fats in there. Um, in terms of meat, say if we weren't doing something like chicken and we were doing pork or we were doing beef, um, if you look at the meats, if you see a lot of that the white marbling in there, is normally a visual indicator that there is a lot of fat in that meat. Don't get me wrong, it probably tastes amazing, hence the ribeye or something like that, but there's a lot of fat that's going on in there as well. Yeah. And kind of a rule of thumb is, you know, when the, the meat, in terms of that marbling, is nice and hot and on your plate, and you stick it in the fridge and it's kind of white and hard after it, mm -hmm. probably want to be more sparing, more sparing with that. Yeah. Yeah. I normally shy away from, especially when I'm being um, very conscious, I shy away from like the ribeyes and my one vice is uh, the tenderloin 
the beef tenderloin, I love them, but I can only have but so much of it because I know that there's a good amount of fat in there. Alternatives might, might be like um, a nice piece of flank steak. Um, doesn't have quite as much uh, fat to it. All right, so our chicken is looking good. She's over here zesting her heart out, <laughs> doing a wonderful job. I okay. yeah. you didn't know it was a hands-on class, know, right? right? Does anybody have any questions around, or around um, food recipe ideas or substituting while we've got the expert in the house? Fish. I love fish. Love fish. Um, I am a salmon fanatic, so I guess that's a good thing because I get a good amount of the, uh, the omega-3s in there, but fish, fish is a good way, a nice lean way to control the uh, fat in the diet, and it's good for you. Yeah. I think you're good. Right. So from here, let's cut the, she's going to cut the oranges in half. This one. Yes. And I'm just removing the chicken from the pan while she's oh, cutting that. Do you want it in half? Or? Um, you could just cut that other one in half. That's perfect. And so we're going to start this next part of the dish, which is the glaze. All right, so you go ahead and me and you, or you and I, will squeeze the juice from the oranges right into the pan. Now, why are we doing it in this pan? It's hot. It's hot, and what else? What's in the pan? Chicken. Flavor. Because you got the food. <laughs> What's me? So we've got the flavor from the chicken that we were just cooking is already in this pan. So we're just going to add the fresh orange juice to that. Just like this. So did you use the olive oil? Oh, yes. Well. When I um, cooked the chicken, I did use olive oil. But you can use canola oil. One thing about olive oil is that olive oil um, doesn't do quite as well to very high heat as, say, like the canola oil does. So if you find that you're using it in a high heat application, you might want to switch to the canola so that the olive oil doesn't burn up. Because if it gets too hot, it'll uh, burn. Okay. So we got our oranges in there. Go ahead and drop your zest in there. Mm -hmm. The zest is great because it gives you a nice deep orange flavor. So we're getting the, the orange flavor from the zest, from the juice, and then let's go ahead and scrape our marmalade in to create our glaze. Alright. So I'm just going to move this around a little bit, get the marmalade to melt. Mary with the juices, Mary with the zest, and then we're going to create our glaze. Now, the optional thing that you can add right at the end, Kyle, as, as I mentioned, that little bit of butter, totally up to you. You don't have to. You could love it just how it is. If you love it just how it is, skip the butter. Okay. And then just another thought. Um, this glaze compared to maybe a butter-based sauce. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Still yeah. getting flavor, but not. Oh, the glaze compared to maybe like a butter-based sauce, the butter and flour. Correct. So. Do you do more citrus than just the oranges? Do you have any other favorites? Um, you? I do like grapefruit. I do like lemon quite a bit. Lemon is a, a wonderful, um, a wonderful fruit, wonderful uh, flavor enhancement. You can use lemon juice instead of salt in a lot of cases mm -hmm, to bring the flavor out. Because a lot of times, dishes just are looking for the flavor just to be woken up just a little bit. And that's what lemon does to a lot of dishes. All right, let's add our chicken to our glaze. <coughs> How is it for the folks that? Good, pretty good? <laughs> Which one are you trying? They're both in one. Oh, they're yeah, both in one. Okay. So it's kind of a, a combo. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be more. So don't, once we're all said and done, we'll have more back there as well. Okay. So I'm just mixing the chicken in here.
with the glaze, kind of giving it, giving the glaze a chance just to coat the chicken, get that flavor on there, get it slightly sticky. Almost like you're grilling outside, where the uh, glaze starts to stick to the meat and so forth. Okay, just like this. And then we're just going to put it on that new plate there. And here we have a double orange glazed chicken. And you can use this chicken with all, I mean this recipe, I'm sorry, with all kinds of proteins. As you can see, it's there listed with the pork chops. You can use chicken, shrimp, scallops. Um, the glaze goes very well over salmon and other fish as well. And here we have our double orange glazed chicken. And you all now have. Um, her question was, do I pour the extra glaze over there? You can pour the extra glaze over there based on the serving here. Um, your total carbs is only 18 grams, so you could pour that on. Or you could opt not to if you think that has enough flavor on it. Right? Yeah, thank, thank you very you so much. Well. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> only because I feel like 